right. Good morning, New Covenant. Morning. Isn't it awesome to worship God? I was just thinking about this. I've been worshiping God for decades now in services like this, and it never gets old. Isn't that right? It just never gets old. Uh, there's a presence here, and it's supernatural. So anyway, it's so good to be in, in church on the last Sunday of the, of the year. Amen? And let's everybody, let's say hi to our North Campus uh, congregation, everybody, greet the North Campus. We're together, even though we're separate locations, one church, one, loca- one church, two locations, so it's good to be joined together and look into the Word of God together. I'm going to invite you, if you want to find with me where I'm going to read, I'm going to read a story out of the Old Testament in 2 Kings 5, 2 Kings 5. If you don't know where 2 Kings 5 is, it's right after 1 Kings. My bad, my bad. I don't, know if, I don't know if you're new to the faith, but if you're new to the faith, when I got saved years ago, we didn't have all this screen stuff, so you actually had to find stuff in your Bible, and uh, the guy would go, hey, turn over to First Chronicles. So I went to the, my favorite book was the book of Table of Contents, you know, and, and then did anybody have those Bibles with the little, remember those little, uh, the ridges, right, you know, where they had the indentations, you know, and, and then, and then some of us, we, we didn't care. We just had the big old tab sticking out, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. It's a tab, you know, like a file system. But pretty soon, if you keep, you keep reading the Word, you, you learn your way around. And if you're new at this, don't despair. You don't know where anything is. Now, we do make it easy for you. Uh, sometimes I, I'm afraid too easy because we do put it on the screen, and that's a great thing. But know your Bible and read your Bible and, and, and know where to find things in the Bible. So we're going to read this fascinating story in 2 Kings chapter 5. And then I'm going to share with you why, why we're going there today. Let's start in verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He, also, he was also a mighty man of valor, like a special forces captain, really, really good in battle, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out in raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, which I assume is the king, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. This was probably several millions of dollars. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. Imagine you getting a letter like that. Here's what the king did. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse 9, Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better Then all the waters of Israel, could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down 
and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Isn't that an interesting story? And it's one of the many strange miracles uh, we read in the life of Elisha. We've heard of Elijah. Elisha was the successor. And Elisha really had twice the anointing of Elijah and had literally had twice as many miracles recorded in Scripture. So here, this man, this mighty captain of the Syria, which was probably the, the strongest nation of the day, the superpower of the day, uh, comes to request through the prophet, really to God, a healing that he nor any man was incapable of doing. And yet, isn't it interesting? We go to God to do what we ask of God or we want from God what only God can do. And yet, we find ourselves dictating the terms. Have you ever found yourself doing that or heard somebody like that? Well, I won't do that or I will never do that. I had a lady one time tell me, she said, I believe in healing, but I'm not going to let anybody lay hands on me. That just violated her religious sensibilities. And I didn't say it. I just thought it. I said, well, I don't know if you're going to get healed. Or if you're going to get healed, it's probably because when you come to the point where you let somebody lay hands on you. You can get healed without somebody laying hands on you. But it's just like God say, oh, yeah? You're not going to, okay, that's what you're telling me? You know, uh, we, we, our natural person, we all of a sudden think we know how to tell God <laughs> what to do. And so this was an interesting story because it would be like one of the... Uh, uh, vi- like say the vice premier of China, the largest nation in the world, very rich, very powerful now, uh, comes to us and, and, and comes to one of our top religious leaders, let's say Franklin Graham, and I need to know about God. Well, what an opportunity. What an opportunity. And Franklin Graham sends his assistant, sends one of his administrative assistants to share the gospel with him. Doesn't go himself. That's kind of what this would be like. You know? You would think we would just stumble over the opportunity. You would think Elisha would have just stumbled over the opportunity to introduce this man and this nation to God. Really, they're coming to Israel for spiritual help, and yet he sends his servant. And so there's this, obviously the Holy Spirit knew and informed Elisha what was going on in Naaman's heart. And when God dictates the circumstances of how he can help us, he does it because he knows what's going on in our life. And we're not God. And we don't get to decide how God does things. So, you know, we have people over the years, uh, I was lead pastor here for 30 years, and, you know, occasionally, not very often, because we have a really great attitude around here, but occasionally you see people like they want help, but they're only going to talk to the senior pastor. It's like, really? Really? You know, Jesus said this. He said, he who receives the one I sent receives me. And one of the things you have to learn about God is he works through delegated authority. I wish he didn't. I wish he just went directly to everybody and didn't send us. Because he's more powerful than we are. But God's looking for something, isn't he? He's looking for humility. He could easily awe humanity into submission. But he doesn't. He uses ordinary looking people. In fact, a lot of people don't know this. Jesus was very ordinary looking. Isaiah the prophet said when we see him, there's no natural beauty. He wasn't like this photogenic guy that everybody would have thought would have been on People magazine. There was no natural beauty we should desire. So God's looking for something in humanity. I heard one guy say, God will offend your mind to reveal your heart. We have to stay humble to receive from God. And there was, this, there was just this one little thing. He came all this way, had all this money, and yet there was something that was hidden in his heart that God needed to reveal. It was just a little thing. And so the Lord, you know, as I prayed about today, Pastor Stephen asked me to share today, and, and I just felt like God directed me to this passage And I'm calling this uh, message a little thing. Because I have found there are many times there's just little things that yield big results. A little thing that's your next step. A little thing 
that can seem so insignificant. You, you say, it can't, it can't be that important. It's got to be a big thing. You know, most of us are ready for the big thing God has, but we can never get to the big thing because sometimes there's a little thing that's the next step to the big thing. And so there's a lot of things in the scripture like this. And I, I thought for, uh, for a few minutes it would be helpful just look at some of the things that could seem insignificant and maybe some of you, this is something you need to do. This is your next thing. This is between you and the big thing God wants to do in your life. One of them, I would say, is water baptism. Water baptism is kind of pictured in this picture of, of, of um, Naaman going into the Jordan. Jordan is, is not, in most places, it's not. I was there in February. We're taking a tour in June. Uh, the church is taking a tour if you want to go. Most, a lot of places it's muddy. It's not an attractive river. And that's what Naaman was saying. It's not an attractive river. Uh, but look, let's see what water baptism does. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now a lot of people think baptism is purely symbolic action. It's like, well, it's just God knows my heart, so I don't need to do the symbol because I have the reality. But the Bible says it's not it's symbolic. It's supernatural. In fact, I, I believe there is nothing in the New Testament that's symbolic. A lot in the Old Testament is symbolic. It pictured a reality that was coming down the road when Jesus came. But now we're after Jesus and there's nothing God asks us to do that does not have supernatural uh, power and grace attached to it. Everything we do has power. Everything he tells us to do has power attached to it. And you need to understand that. And water baptism is one of of the things. It looks just symbolic. Uh, I'm going to go down dry and I'm going to come up wet. And and it's just revealing my faith. And there are even churches that teach that. They teach water baptism, but they don't teach, it's, they don't teach there's any power to it. It's just symbolism. Now, I was guilty of believing this. I was saved in college. I was saved as a freshman in college. I was 18 years old, and it was in October. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I got my prayer language six, six days later. The fire of heaven filled my soul. I was, we were witnessing and evangelizing and my life was rocked man and I'm like uh you know we started preaching on the campus and traveling to other towns and preaching on the weekends and and that summer I was uh, uh pastoring a youth group and revival broke out in this church where I was the youth pastor and I'm like this little kid man God was in, just using me now it was just amazing right I just went right past water baptism <laughs> I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But you know, I had a lot of growing to do, even though God was using me. And that, that fall, uh, the next year, I went to a retreat on a, on a ranch in, up in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and my friend was getting baptized in water, and it was February, and they said, Ron here is going to get baptized in water. We're at, they announced it, and, and the Lord said, and you are too. Did I tell you it was February? Yeah. <laughs> and they have indoor baptism? You better do what God says or he's going to tell you to do it when it ain't fun, you know. <laughs> it was cold, but God did it, you know, because God knew I needed to do what he, I needed that little thing because there were some issues of my past that needed to get buried. And we, we, we must do what God's word says. Another thing that a lot of people are minimizing today and I'm not preaching to you because you're here, but church attendance, and you know people like this. They think it's not a big deal. I never, you know, I think it's a sign of our time. And yes, you can, you know, it, you're not saved or lost whether you're in church or not. I think if you're saved, you're going to be in church, personally. But, but you know, thought, well, it's just religious. I don't want to be religious. I'm legalist. God knows my heart, you know. Yeah, but he commanded you to go to church. And if you don't want to do what God commands then maybe you don't know your heart like he does. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together is the manner of some, exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So we see all these people, they're Christians, they have a relationship with God, but they don't go to church. They don't see the need. Maybe they didn't, maybe they've never been to a life-giving church. Maybe you're watching this online and you've never been to a, really a life-giving church. So you just think, I'm just going to stay home and I'll get fed the word and we worship God, and, 
you know, but it, that just seems like it doesn't do a lot for me. But you know, there's a reason God commanded it. Because there's something supernatural you get in a life-giving church. You cannot ever get by yourself. Right. Amen? Amen? You cannot repeat this. Right. I don't care. I've, I've gone away and prayed and fasted 21 days. And, but I'm telling you, there's, there's more anointing on one Sunday, Sunday morning when God's people worship than me on my own out in the desert somewhere seeking God. Because this is where he, this is the, we're built together for a dwelling place of God. God's a corporate God. So yeah, you can call it religious, but God doesn't call it religious. That's what you're calling it. And you need to tell people, you know, that don't go to church anywhere. You know what? The Bible says this. And don't be afraid to tell people what the Bible says. We see such an intimidation today among many Christians. They won't tell people what the Bible says. We're so into this weird fear issue of, well, this is what you believe. This is what I believe. And I don't impose my beliefs on you. No, you, need to, you have an obligation. Yes. If you care about people, tell them what God's word says because you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. Amen. People are caught up in so many bondages. And you may be the person that tells them the truth. And we've seen it over and over and over and over. Oh, I was doing fine. I was doing fine. Oh, okay, I'll finally come to your church. Oh, my gosh, where have you been, God? Total difference. Amen? Because how many know, away from this, you can talk yourself into lots of stuff. You can talk yourself into all kinds of ideas and thoughts and beliefs. Another one's prayer. Now, prayer, we, I think everybody prays. More people pray than go to church. But we can also forget to pray. Notice what the Bible says. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5. In everything give thanks for uh, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, God, what's your will? What's your will? Well, here's his will. Pray, rejoice, give thanks. The, the other will, I know what you say. I want to know what your will is for me. And I have news for you. God wants to tell you what that is. He's not playing games with you. You know, he's not, he's not like, okay, throw darts until you hit something, you know. He, he wants to reveal his will to you. This next season, 21 days, we pray. We pray for 21 days. There, there's some fasting involved. It, you can do as much or little as you want. There's some guidelines that uh, Pastor Steve will be sharing with you next Sunday. But it's that process of seeking God, and we're going to teach people, hey, God, God speaks. God will show you. It's really cool when God speaks to you. Amen? Amen. It's really cool when you see what you couldn't see and hear what you've never heard. And you know you're on track with God's will. That's really, really amazing. We're wired for that and we're restless until we find it. But you can't get that if you don't want, if you, you can't get the unrevealed will of God until you do the revealed will of God. And this is the revealed will of God. Are you praying? Are you rejoicing? Are you giving thanks? So, so prayer is a little thing. It's not a big deal. It's not climbing Mount Everest. It's not running a marathon. I was talking to a guy this morning. I was training for a marathon. It's not running a marathon. It's not going across the sands of the desert barefoot to prove your spirituality. It's a little thing. It's not a big deal. But it has big results. Prayer. Uh, regular times of prayer. Constant praying. It has huge dividends, guys. I can't tell you the number of things that God has shown me over the years that have huge effect because I have a regular time of prayer. Now, there's, every time I have a regular prime, time of prayer, He doesn't show me amazing things. It's kind of like being a parent. You know, I tell parents, I said, if you want the extraordinary times, have the ordinary times. Have a lot of ordinary times and then the extraordinary times are going to kick in. It's like any relationship. Marriage is the same way. Everything's not amazing. But then there's amazing moments. Being a parent's like that. Being a Christian is like that. Having a relationship with God is like that. So there's a lot of times I spend an hour with God. It's like, okay, I feel peace. And I'm, I, put it, I have confidence for my day. But nothing earth shaking. No vision, dreams, all that stuff. And another time I'd just be praying. And he just might download something. And I go do this. And hundreds or thousands of people would be affected. It's amazing what God does. Because I'm in that place to hear from Him. It's a little thing. It has big results. That's why we want to encourage you to have a structured time of prayer. Uh, the model prayer, we'll be teaching through that in this next season, in 21 days of prayer. Uh, 
because it's, it's how Jesus taught us to pray. It's amazing. All these people write books on prayer, and they give you all their little formulas, and you got to kind of keep the book with you to remember it. How about just remember Matthew 6? Mm, you know, I'm going to go with Jesus' model. You know, I'm just, that's just me. I'm sorry, you know. There's other models, but I'm going to go with Jesus. I like his the best. Being thankful is just a little thing. It's a little thing. And you know what? It's not a feeling. It's a choice. It says rejoice always, be constantly praying, and in everything give thanks. Didn't say for everything. You don't have to thank him for your car that broke down. But in your car breaking down, give thanks. Now let me tell you what giving thanks does. It's a little thing. It's super faith builder. You got this thing that's facing you. You got a bill you don't know how to pay. You got a relationship you don't know how to fix. And you're about to pray about that. But let me tell you what to do. And you'll learn this in the model prayer next, next, uh, next month. We'll get into this. Lord, I, I'm about to ask you this thing. Lord, I, I just, first of all, I want to thank you for always being there. And how you've been so, and you just thank him for a minute. And you know what just happened? You just got faith. And you know what God's after? Faith. He's not after just your sincerity. He's after faith. He, he's after you coming to the point where you actually believe him. If you want to see God move, believe him. Amen. Period. Amen. If you want to see the hand of God, believe him. Amen. And the quickest way to get your faith airborne and active is thanksgiving. Don't, well, I, you know, God does something for me. I'll thank him. Well, you're, you're kind of clueless. If I can say so. He's already done a lot for you. In Him we live. In Him we move. In Him we have our being. The fact that your brain is working, which some people may question, but let's, it's working to some degree, right? Here's one. I love this one. Little thing. Ask God for wisdom. You'd think that would be self-evident. How much do we worry? And not pray. And, and you know what? And there's, there's prayer. There's, a, there's, there's worrying in prayer and there's worrying in prayer. Don't be a worrier in prayer. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just thank you. But you know, God, it's just so hard. And you know, I don't know what those people out in Washington are doing. And it's just so hard. And just, Lord, help us, please. That was inspiring. You ready to go? You ready to go now? So, so you start with thanksgiving, and then ask God, James 1.5, one of my favorite verses, if any of you at, lacks wisdom, how many of you qualify? <laughs> I qualify for that. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, what does God do? What does God do? How smart is God? How many of you know the God we pray to is pretty smart? Yes. He's crazy smart. He's got a pretty high IQ pretty brilliant. He's pretty powerful. He's pretty loving. Well, I don't know if he loves me. Look at the cross. All you do is look at the cross. Don't look at your circumstances all the time. Look at the cross. Start with the cross. He loves you. So you got a God who loves you, who's all powerful, who's all wise, all knowing. He's got every answer you need. I think I would go for him to him for advice. I think he knows what he's talking about. So just ask him. God, I don't know what to do. Quit trying to solve your problems by yourself. Now, I believe God wants us to apply ourselves and learn things and get help and get counsel. But guys, ask wisdom. He gives it liberally. Amen. Wow. Man, that's faith builder for me. I don't know what to do, Lord. But you do. And I ask you, right now, I ask you for wisdom. And Lord, I believe, I believe you, God, in advance for this wisdom. God wants to take the fear of making mistakes, listen to me, out of your life. That's powerful. To live life in faith and not in fear. So many people are so afraid of making the bad decision, they don't make decisions. They're risk averse in a way that's paralyzing. And there is no such thing as a risk-free life. Can I just say what a risk-free life is? Boring. Or maybe you're not even alive. (laughs) 
Quit being afraid of the risk. Go for it, man. Go for the adventure God has for you. You're never going to, you know, when you pray and you pray and you pray, and it's still, when you got to make a choice, you're still going to feel a little something inside of you in your gut, man. It's just going to be churning, and you're going to go, I don't know. And you're going to second guess yourself. Isn't that fun? That's what life's fun about. Because God wants you to face things that make you nervous, face things that might make you a little afraid, and he proves himself in that situation. And you go, yeah, that wasn't so bad. Let's do the next one, you know. Let's do the next one. Let's meet the next challenge. Let's take on the next goal that we have, God wants you to have. God, he wants you to learn to trust him and trust that when he knows, he, well, I don't know if I can hear God. Well, you can hear God. You're made in his image. If you're a child, his child, my sheep hear my voice. I think, I mean, I think somebody really needed that right now. Tithing and giving, little thing. Giving God 10%. Some people think this is terrible. What does God say? I will open the heaven, windows of heaven. Bring all the tithes to earth and may be food in my house. The rest of the verse says that I will open the windows of heaven. Prove me, he says. Prove me. Now, you know what? I, mean, I believe God deserves our 10%. Anybody believe that besides me? I mean, he gives us everything. And he, and he uses it to run his work, that there may be food in my house so that you can have a place like this and you can get fed. And that's how, that's how the system works. You know, some of you may go out to eat after this or you may go to shop at the grocery store. You don't just say thank you. You give them, right? Hopefully. You give them a check or give them a credit card or something, you know. And that's how you get food. And that's how God gets food to his people, the bread of life through giving of his people. So he didn't have to add, prove me. He could have just said, do this. But he says, prove me. He knows how fear-driven we are, how much, how much of a poverty mentality we have. That's a symptom of the fall. What if I don't have enough? What if I don't have enough? He goes, come on, come on, let go, let go. Trust me, Amen. trust me, Amen. prove me. How many, of you, how many of you know this was a challenge, learning to tithe? Me too, man. That, that $2, that was a lot of money. I was a college student. But I'm going to tell you, it will break the back of poverty in your life. It will break the poverty spirit out of your life. I, I, I know churches that have poverty all over them because they don't, they, they don't believe in it. We have to tell pastors this sometimes. You know, I was a youth pastor, and I went to this missions conference with my pastor. It's a little old bitty church. And they said, pray about what you're supposed to give for missions this year. I thought they were talking to us individually. These guys weren't even paying me anything. I'm praying about it. What do I do? God gave me a number. I wrote it down, turned it in. And then the pastor wrote one. He put it down. Like, he was writing for the whole church. I was just writing for me. Mine was bigger than his. It's like... What? I see why you guys, I mean, I didn't say this to him. It blew my mind. See, it's a little thing, guys. How many of you have seen a little thing like, okay, I can do the math here. Move a decimal, write the check. How many of you have seen a little thing do big things in your life? How many of you have seen, look around, look around. If you're struggling with this, look around. It's a little thing. And our brains, our flesh, our sinful, tr our minds trained in corruption can talk us into greed and covetousness and selfishness and fear. And God wants to break everything, every one of those. He doesn't need our money, but he wants to break that off of us. Because he's, how I many you know he's pretty rich? He is so rich. But this is how he opens the windows of heaven for his people. Forgiveness seems simple. You would think those of us who've been forgiven would have no problem, but we do. It's a little thing, but I'm telling you, it has big results. If you do it or if you don't do it, it has big results. Jesus was very clear here. If you forgive men, your Father will forgive you. A lot of people don't know there's a condition 
on continued forgiveness from God himself. Now maybe you've heard some preacher who's just being shallow and hadn't read his Bible. Well, you know, there's no conditions on God forgiving. Sounds great, it's just not biblical. Here's a condition. You're forgiven, now you have to go forgive. If you don't, you won't be forgiven. That, is, that, is that what this is saying? Right. Don't look at me like I'm preaching some false doctrine. How many of you say, that's what it's saying, Pastor Chuck? Let me see here. We'll make sure we're on the same page. Some of you are very slow to raise your hand right now. <laughs> I didn't make this up. Look it up. Why? Well, it's pretty terrible, really, if you think about it. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells a parable about a guy who was forgiven, in effect, $20 million debt, and he wouldn't forgive, like, a $200 debt. And that's, that's what we're doing when we won't forgive somebody. Well, you hurt me. You made me suffer. Well, God, you hurt God. You sent his son to the cross. He's paid a bigger price to forgive us than any of us will ever have to pay to forgive anybody else. So who in the world do we think we are to say, I won't forgive you? You think, well, I won't let them off the hook. You're not hurting them one bit. You're hurting yourself. You're the prisoner still. That's also in Matthew 18. He said, if you don't forgive, you'll be turned over to the tormentors. And so being turned over to the tormentors is a big deal. There's people walking around. They're, they're full of anger. They're full of emotional pain. They suffer all of the time. They're always, bl- if you say, if you're around somebody and they're just always flying off the handle, they're always angry. They're always like, what, what, what was that? It's like there's an unresolved wound in their soul. And many times this has to do with somebody they haven't forgiven. Well, I just can't forgive. Well, you just told God he was not telling you the truth as he tells you to. How many know whatever God tells you to do, you can do? Let me see your hand on that. Still, I need to make sure. Okay, good, you're with me. Whatever God tells you to do, you can do. The fact that he told you to do it means you can do it because he made you. He knows you. And it's for, it's, how many know, it's in your best interest. Tear up the IOU, man. Open the cage, let them out. They were never there to begin with. You were in the cage. It's a little thing, but it has big results. And some of you, and I believe this is what the Lord put this whole message on my heart for. Some of you, this is how you need to close your year out. This is the last Sunday, Pastor Mark said. <sighs> Let's have that clean bill of health, man. Let's get ready to get launched, launched into the new decade. Are you ready? Are you ready for 2020? Well, make sure that there's nothing pulling you back, man. No ropes around your ankles just holding you, trying to go, and the weights on your soul are still weighing you down. And this is one of the big ones, guys. It has big results, but it's a little thing. It's a decision you make. Somebody today, I know I'm talking to somebody, you need to make this decision today. It's simple. I choose. I choose because you've forgiven me. This is how I say it. Lord, because you've forgiven me, I forgive. And then you name that person. You name that person. And you're going to get healed. You're going to see the power. You're going to see the freedom. Here's a little thing. Inviting people to church. How much does that cost? Another 30 seconds? Another minute? Another two minutes in your time? Inviting people to church. Do you have a good church to go to? Love to invite you to mine. Why is it important? Because we just saw the church is where God, they experience God. I can tell them about the gospel. The church is where they see the gospel. They see the, the redeemed, the company of the redeemed. They, they feel the presence of God. They feel his presence. It's the heavens are open where the world they live in, the heavens are not open. I bring them into God's place. God's really is like his temple. The building's not his temple, but we are his temple. Collectively, we're living stones built together for a presence of God. It's a, big, it's a big result. It changes people's lives. It saves them for all eternity because they see this God. They, they really thought they believed him, but they really didn't because now they're with people who really do. And they see the difference. It's a little thing. And yet sometimes we're so busy or we think they won't, they've already been invited and they already maybe go to church. And You know, here's what I've been finding. When I invite people to church, I say, do you have a, a, a great church you go to? I don't. 
Most of the people now, right here in East Texas, this is what I'm te- they're telling you. Quit assuming everybody's, you know, serving God or going to church. Invite them to your church. Share the gospel. Look for, look for the invite as an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. These are some of the things... Uh, by the way, uh, I was reading a book recently, before I move off of this one, I was reading a book uh, that says uh, most unchurched people, the thing they believe will influence them the most with, is conversations about God with people they know or going to a church. So they're ready. They just don't know where to go. Imagine you don't go to church somewhere. Imagine you don't have a relationship with the church. Where do you go? Chances are you're not just going to pick something off the street, you don't know anybody there, but you might go and probably would go with somebody that invited you. Amen. I'll be there. I look forward to you. I'll pick you up. Let's go. Love to have you come. You can sit with me. Amen. That's that's that can have huge results. So I've just listed some of the things in the scripture I could think of, but here's the thing. It could be something else. It could be a little thing. And the something else could be the last thing God told you to do. What's the last thing God told you? Have you done it? Well, I don't know. I hadn't done it, but I'm just, I don't, I I need to see where, what my future is. I found out God's, God's not going to tell me the next thing until I do the last thing. (laughs) Now, there's some people I find that are like, they're gas pedal people. And other people are brakes people. Which one are you? Are you a brakes person or are you a gas pedal person? You know, most of the time they're married to each other. They work together in organizations. I'm a, I'm a gas pedal, in case you didn't know. And, you know, uh, and my wife's a brakes person, you know. And, that, and it's, it's how we work, right? It's a cool partnership. And so because I'm a gas pedal person, God has a lot of times he tells me, pump the brakes, <laughs> Not literally when I'm driving. I'm not going to receive that persecution from anybody. But in, in life, and it may be the thing that I see some things and I can't wait to get to them. And he says, okay, but do this and just wait. Just wait. Let me unfold. Let me unfold. I've been in that season. And uh, it's coming to an end. It's exciting because I've just, that's the last thing he told me to do. So I'm just, okay, I'll be waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. 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 What's God telling you to do? If you don't know, Next month is a great chance as we seek God together for you to hear God tell you the specific things He wants you to know. If you've never given your life to Jesus, really given your life to Jesus, can I just say that's the next thing for you to do? And that's not a little thing. Everything else I've said is a little thing. That's a big thing. Once you do that, once you really give your life to Jesus, it's all downhill. I'm I'm telling you the truth. It's downhill after that. That's the, that's the top of the mountain. Everything else is, relatively speaking, easy. Yeah, I struggle with tithing. Yeah, I struggle learning to have discipline in prayer. But it was nothing, nothing like giving my life to Jesus. That was a big one. That's death, burial, and resurrection. That's like getting married for life. You know, doing the chores is a little thing after that. Fixing friction problems between us. But the I do, that's a big one. And for some of you, it seems hard to live life. It seems hard to be a Christian because you're still holding on to your life. It's still your life. And this this doesn't work if it's you. Paul said, I no longer live. I no longer live. But the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died for me, who lives in me now. And so, we're going to pray in just a minute, but... And I'm going to ask you to pray about what is, is there a little thing? Is there a little thing that you need to do that's standing between you and the big thing? Naaman had to do a little thing. And he got a big thing. He got healed of leprosy. Amen? That's pretty good stuff. Is there a little thing that, that's next for you? That's what I'm going to ask you to pray about. And if you're here or on the other campus or online, and you've never given your life to Jesus. That's the big thing. And everything else after that will be little things. Trust me. Let's pray. Just bow your head with me if you would. And Father, we just thank you for Jesus. Amen. We have, as Pastor Mike said, have celebrated this birth 
this wonderful birth of Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, to sp- I just ask you to speak to all of us, Lord. Is there a little thing that I need to do before this year ends? Is there a step I need to take? Is there something you've been telling me to do and I've, I've minimized it or I've put it off, I've brushed it aside or maybe I've been afraid to do it? Maybe get in a life group. Maybe lead a life group. My next step, what is that? To join the church. Go witness to a co-worker. Go reach out to a family member that I know is not right with God. Seems like a big deal, but it's not. It's not a big deal. It's a little deal that has big results. It's a little step that has powerful possibilities. Just ask God, Lord, what is the next thing? What is the thing? Is there something? Just ask Him and listen. Maybe in my preaching, as I listed the things in the Scripture, there was something that stuck out to you, and that's your thing. If you're here today and you need to give your life to Jesus, by now you know that. By now the Holy Spirit has made that real to you. And I'm just going to give you an opportunity to do that both campuses or even online and everyone will join me in this prayer if you want and you're ready to give your life to Jesus just and I just urge you don't put this off don't go into 2020 without God let him have your life just reach out to him just say this Lord Jesus everybody pray it out loud Lord Jesus I believe in you you are the son of God that you died on the cross And I want you to make me a new person, Lord. I don't want to live my life for myself. I want to give it to you, Lord. I ask you to lead me and guide me the way you would have me go. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Those who prayed that prayer, let's give them a hand of just support, appreciation with you guys totally 100 percent we love to just journey with you into the life god has for you if you if you did pray that prayer there's a yes card if, the, if you're one of our campuses in the seat back in front of you grab it for a minute our prayer time is going to come is going to prayer team is going to come to the front at both campuses and uh you might want to bring this card with you and just hand it to one of our team members because they'll, they will take this and they'll get you some information that helps you. You can also drop it on the, on the way out in one of our boxes. But let's stand and, and uh, be dismissed. But if you made a prayer, if you prayed that prayer, please let me urge you to take a minute, fill this out, hand it to one of our team members or drop it in, in the box on the way out. And if you need prayer, sometimes the little thing is letting somebody pray with you. Remember, it can be humbling. It can seem insignificant. I've prayed many prayers. But you know, the Bible says, talks about the power of agreement. So if, our team, if you need prayer for something, and maybe you've been praying about it a while, and you are not seem to get anywhere, let's let somebody else join their faith with you. Amen? That's how miracles happen. All right? God bless you guys. We'll see you. Have a great day. We'll see you next year. Amen. Don't miss it. It's going to be awesome.